This is the shore on the south side of St Moore's Harbour, opposite the picturesque old town. It's one of the richest in Cornwall for seashore life. That's what I'd come here to see, so these oyster catchers were an unexpected bonus. With their heads bent down and scarlet beaks open, several of them seem to be exhibiting a large amount of aggression towards their compatriots. Or could it perhaps be the opposite, a form of courtship? I don't know. The waters of the harbour are filled with a dense bed of eelgrass. The eelgrasses are some of the very few plants that actually flower and fruit underwater in the sea. They provide a home for a rich variety of animal life. As the tide recedes, various kinds of sea creatures are exposed. The common grey sea slug feeds on sea anemones. Years ago, I watched one munching away on a snake lox anemone. Favourite food for the tiny spotted cowry is star ascidians, a kind of sea squirt. But I've never actually seen a cowry feeding. As the tide recedes, most types of crabs hide themselves away beneath rocks. But not the scorpion spider crab. It stays in full view, swimming around. Here we're looking directly down on its body, with its head and eyes pointing towards the top of the frame. See how it's camouflaged itself with small tufts of seaweeds. Next day, I headed for another exceptionally rich shore on the Helford River. I'm looking for one particular rock pool. Years ago, this had been a really good site for fan worms. And as it turns out, they're still here. The worm's body is concealed inside a vertical burrow. From the burrow's open end, the worm can extrude a fan of feathery tentacles, around 50 in all. From the far end of each tentacle, there is a tiny but very effective eye spot. These are extremely sensitive to the slightest movement up above. If it detects danger, the worm can withdraw its tentacles in a flash. Because they're essential for feeding, the tentacles never remain retracted for long. The tentacles bear masses of tiny hair-like cilia. These are constantly vibrated, creating a current of water from which suspended food particles can be filtered from the surrounding water. By contrast, netted dog whelks go for larger food items, such as rotting dead crabs or fish. The lifestyle of a scavenger is also followed by prawns. With their almost transparent bodies, they can be difficult to spot as they hang motionless in the water. Like the fan worms, these tiny light bulb sea squirts filter food particles out of the surrounding water body. Unlike most birds, shags and cormorants have to dry their wings after diving for fish. This is because the wings and body lack the usual oily coating found in most birds. The upside is faster movement underwater. The life on rocky shores and sandy shores is radically different. The top of this beach is filled with the humming of thousands of bees. These are all male ivy bees.
So, what's the source of all this frantic activity? It's the prospect of finding a virgin female emerging from her burrow for the first time into the open air. During her short but busy life, she'll only mate once. So every male is desperate to be the one who takes her virginity. At any one time, there's a huge number of males and a severe shortage of females. This leads to the kind of frantic competition seen here. In a frenzied scrum, up to 50 or more males form these so-called mating balls. But by now, they've all lost the race. Somewhere, buried under all those struggling bodies, there's a female who already has a consort. He was the winner. So why do all the other bees keep on battling away? Well, at this stage, they're still not aware that they're all losers. And then, at some point, the female's attractiveness suddenly evaporates. And then the surrounding scrum of bees thins out, revealing the mating pair. There they are, top right. They're still being pestered by a few particularly persistent males, but nothing like the previous mass. The ratio between the males and females is about equal. But all the males hatch first, followed by the females in dribs and drabs. That's why the competition is so intense. But the throng of eager suitors is not kept unoccupied for long. Every few minutes, a new virgin female emerges into the light. And so the whole mad, crazy scramble kicks off over and over again. Sometimes as many as a dozen of these mating balls can be seen spread over quite a small area of sand. Amazingly, the IVB only arrived in Britain in 2001, but has now spread widely. Unlike the common gorse, which flowers mainly in spring, the western gorse comes into bloom in autumn. It's then that the Cornish heaths become colourful patchworks of yellow gorse and purple bell heather. Both of these are heavily visited by bumblebees. Spending the morning away from the nearby ponds, this female common darter is snapping up small flying insects. As the sun suddenly gets hotter, she tilts her abdomen upwards to minimise the heat absorption. This is known as the obelisk pose. As she returns from her brief flight, she seems to be chewing on something, probably a small insect. Meanwhile, the nearest pond is occupied by a constantly patrolling male. For the moment at least, he's managed to take control of this piece of airspace over his many rivals. When a female does eventually show up, she'll initially start to lay her eggs alone. But not for long. With his mobile bird's eye view, this male will soon spot her and grab her. When that happens, she'll give way to the inevitable and allow him to mate with her. In the common data, the act of mating only takes a few minutes. Then it's straight off to the nearby pond to begin laying eggs. The females are actually capable of laying eggs by themselves. But usually, the male retains his grip behind the female's head in the so-called tandem position. And he's actually in control of the whole process. As they dip up and down, the eggs are washed off the tip of the female's body into the water and onto nearby vegetation. By staying in contact like this, the male makes it virtually impossible for his mate to be hijacked by any of his rivals. The downside is the reduction in new mating opportunities available to him because of the amount of time he's spending in the egg laying process. So, like most things in life, it's a trade-off. As the ponds begin to dry out, they continue laying their eggs on the bare ground. This will soon be covered with water again when the winter rains arrive. It 
It's now early September, but the purple loosestrife is still in good flower. The goldenrod is another late bloomer. It seems to attract hoverflies rather than bees. The common fleabane has a long flowering season, continuing well into September. It's visited by a particularly wide range of insects, including this beautiful newly hatched male brimstone butterfly. as well as a solitary small copper. Water mint is another plant that keeps on delivering through late summer. A female large white butterfly has her visit rudely interrupted by an intruding male. Eventually she's forced to hide down amongst the water mint's leaves. For me, the classic late summer flower is the Devil's Bit Scabious. It often occurs in such numbers that it forms a purple haze. Its favourite habitat is damp, marshy places. There's usually plenty of insects present on its flowers. This small tortoiseshell butterfly is having a final feeding spree before going into winter hibernation. This is the same male brimstone we saw earlier on the flea vein. He's now switched to the scabious. He seems to prefer it, as he spends much more time on it. On some of the flowers, there are unseen hazards present. Crab spiders may be lurking in ambush, waiting for an unsuspecting insect. Can you see the white spider here? This small tortoiseshell is in no danger. It's too big to be caught. For this butterfly, old, weak and battered by life, death by lethal injection has come swiftly. Devil's bit scabious flowers are the best place to find rather a scarce hoverfly, Cerecomia superbiens, long known as Arctophila fulva. It's a superb mimic of the common carder bumblebee. Note the large bulbous eyes of the hoverfly. The bee's eyes are much smaller, as we'll see in a second. The bee also works at a noticeably more urgent pace. It has many hungry males to feed. The hoverfly can take time out to relax and groom its body. So now let's see if you can tell the difference. If you like, you can leave some comments. This time the hoverfly is replaced by the bee. Our tawny little bumblebee mimic is in the same genus as this super large wasp mimic the bog hoverfly, Cerecomia silentis. It too is particularly fond of devil's bit scabious flowers.
On the coastal cliffs, the variety of wild flowers is now beginning to wind down. The most prominent is the delicate purple-flowered rock sea lavender. This is a much smaller plant than the common sea lavender, which grows in salt marshes and is strangely absent from Cornwall. On the edge of the brackish water down at Lerin, the sea aster is now in flower. The only seaweed occurring at Larin is the horned rack. This lives here because the water is brackish rather than being strongly salty. This school of thick-lipped grey mullet has come a long way from the open sea. As they graze on the riverbed, they're almost in pure fresh water. Whenever I come to Larin, there always seems to be a solitary little egret fishing. Watch how it's vibrating its feet. It's trying to persuade the fish to betray themselves by moving. This sudden little dance seems to have the same purpose, but it misses. The egret shares its hunting patch with the mullet, but they're far too large for it to bother with. I remain rather puzzled why they kept on tilting their bodies, exposing their silvery flanks flashing in the sunshine. Meanwhile, the egret kept on beavering away, but still without any success. At this time of the year, the mallard ducks are in their drab winter plumage. At last, success, the egret finally catches a fish. But one fish is hardly enough, so back to work it goes. On Bodmin Beacon, the first tree to ripen its fruits is the rowan. This fact is soon noticed by the resident speckled wood butterflies. The feast was soon joined by surprising numbers of Red Admirals. And then it was time for the birds to join in. The main participants were female blackbirds. They were large enough to deal with berries of this size.
Once all the available berries have gone, she has to look round for some more. The ones she chose were wobbly, so she had to use her wings for balance. This female's gorged herself to the point where she can hardly move. So she just sits and basks for a while, enjoying the sun. Once the blackbirds have prepared the way, the much smaller bullfinches can take their share. Their beaks are too small to tackle the whole berry. But as each fruit is torn off by the blackbirds, it leaves behind a blob of pulp. It's this that the bullfinch has come to harvest. It's easily swallowed by a bird of this size. This female I spent a lot of time here and I lived in hope of seeing a male. But he only showed up once, and very briefly. The goldfinches ignored the bright red rowan berries. What they were interested in was the ripe seeds contained within the catkins on the birch trees. See how the bird pulls each catkin around with its beak and then shreds it, extracting the seeds. The wood pigeons long ago finished nesting. They now spend most of their time pottering around on the ground looking for scraps of food. There's still plenty of ripe blackberries around and they're still attracting plenty of butterflies such as these red admirals and this comma. When its wings are closed the comma bears a striking resemblance to a dead oak leaf. This is important at any time but particularly during its winter hibernation. Whereas small tortoiseshells and peacocks hibernate under cover, the comma perches fully exposed on a tree trunk. Its leaf-like outline then helps to conceal it from the prying eyes of hungry birds. But what about the winter weather? Gales, rain, hail, sleet, snow, frost. Enough commas seem to survive these hazards to kick off the next generation in springtime. Stoking up now on blackberry juice is probably vital to help it survive the winter. No wonder if the sun shines they spend all day every day on the blackberries. Unlike the blackberries, the ripe slows don't seem to attract anything. Eventually they just shrivel up and fall off the trees. Suddenly, in mid-September, garden spider webs seem to sprout everywhere. 
They've actually been there through much of the summer, but it's only now that they're large enough to become prominent. It's fascinating to watch how this female attaches the spirals to the radius threads that she's already established in place. Once started, she builds the whole web in one single hit. The silken thread is emitted by the spinnerets at the tip of her abdomen. Using her legs and body as her measuring instruments, she accurately and precisely attaches each spiral thread to the radius. When the job's complete, she sits in the centre of the web and waits for the first insect to show up. This could be a long and fruitless wait. Some webs never manage to catch anything before they become so tatty that they have to be replaced. Being both large and strong, the garden spider's web can snare quite sizeable insects. This female turns a dot bug over and over as she shrouds it in silk. If she's not feeling hungry, she'll store it somewhere in the web, until later. Stored food is sometimes stolen by wasps in a bold raid. I watched this wasp pluck a fly out of the silk. Now it's chewing it, ready to take back to the nest and feed to the larvae. Garden spider females usually lose their virginity quite early on, shortly after their final molt into the adult state. She's now in quite a weak state, so there's no danger to the male. She's not really interested in mating again, so any late coming males are going to run into serious problems. They're clearly aware of the danger and approach the female with extreme caution, ready to back off at the slightest threat. The male is the small, nervous-looking one on the right. The male's vibrating body and legs are supposed to diffuse the female's aggression and put her in a mood for sex. Eventually, this male seems to have cause for optimism. She drops her body downwards slightly, usually a sign that she's getting in the mood. At this stage, I was expecting to film them mating. Out of the blue, her mood suddenly changes and she grabs him and bites him. Her venom is powerful, so for the male, death is almost instantaneous. Turning him over and over, she wraps him in silk, just like normal insect prey. When he's all packaged up, He's ready to provide her with her next meal. The garden spider builds an orb web. There are lots of other spiders that build webs in the shape of a hammock. Both kinds are intermixed on this gorse bush. In this web, the sagging lower sheet supplies the hammock section. Above this are numerous intertangled trip lines. This web belongs to the female of a common hammock spider. She spends her life suspended from the underside, waiting for prey to arrive. She won't move round to the top of the hammock in order to deal with prey. Instead, she remains on the underside and pulls it laboriously through the silk, cutting it where necessary. When I arrived, she'd already been dealing with this fly for some time. She's now pulled it through and can start wrapping it in silk. When she's finished, she may end up not having the meal all to herself. She might have to share it with a lodger in the form of a male. From midsummer onwards, a male will be in residence in most females' webs. As will be evident, the male on the right is about as large as the web's owner. He also has much longer fangs and front legs. 
He therefore has little to fear during his long spell close up to the female. At regular intervals, he'll engage in a courtship session, usually with no result. With vibrating legs and body, he creeps towards the female, trying to elicit some interest. But she's feeling touchy. He ignores her attempt to drive him away and just keeps on trying. Just three or four times over the last 40 years, I've chanced upon one of entomology's great mysteries. The huge swarms formed by the tiny fly Sepsis fulgens. These usually take place in the autumn, as now. If you don't spot the flies themselves, then you'll probably notice a strong smell that emanates from the swarm. This is thought to be a pheromone released by the flies that enables them to assemble. What we don't know is why they do it. You'll spot the odd fly briefly jumping on the back of another, but you won't see any actually mating. They just seem to devote all their time to aimlessly running around, waving their spotty wings. There has been a number of theories as to why these swarms form, but personally I'm not convinced by any of them. Maybe you can suggest a reason, and solve this long-standing mystery. For late autumn insects, which are in need of a supply of nectar or pollen, and the only available source comes from the flowers of ivy. These go on long after everything else is finished. See how this blowfly repeatedly dabs its proboscis onto the shining bowl of nectar. While I was filming this, a red admiral turned up and actually brushed my face with its wings as it landed on the flowers. Just note how accurately the butterfly manages to dab its long proboscis onto the source of nectar. On this particular day, this small patch of ivy was host to at least seven different species of hoverflies. This large tiger hoverfly turned out to be the first record for this area. By late September, the most abundant visitors are females of the ivy bee. As their name suggests, ivy is a vital plant for them. In fact, it supplies all the pollen and nectar they need for stocking their larval cells. Crane flies are scarce and occasional visitors. They only have very short mouth parts. So the freely exposed nectar of the ivy is easily accessible to them. It's more common to see crane flies stabbing their bodies up and down, laying their eggs among the grass roots. Note the pointed tip to her abdomen. The larvae, often called leather jackets, eat the grass roots. In some years, towards the end of September, there's a series of low tides. I'm here on the south coast to film a fairly rare creature living on these rocks. As the tide recedes, out come the Celtic sea slugs, previously hidden away underwater in rock crannies. It's now in the open air that they choose to come out and feed, rather than when covered with water. They crawl so slowly that their bodies almost seem to ooze forwards grazing on various kinds of small algae. This is quite a rare creature. On mainland Europe, it's only found on the west coast of France. In Britain, it's found in Cornwall, Devon, South Wales and Western Scotland. But within each area, its distribution is very patchy, so it's always scarce. In a particularly suitable habitat though, they can be quite abundant. A 
As its name suggests, the common starfish is by no means rare. At low tide you often find them stranded out of water on the rocks. This one is sitting on a bed of mussels, its main food. See how its multitude of tube feet wave around. It uses these for pulling open the shells of its prey as well as walking and swimming. You rarely seem to find them in rock pools, so I'm lucky to find this one, which was one of three. It's surprising how fast they can move when they get going. If it loses one or more of its arms, it can easily regenerate them. As the tide goes out, small groups of ringed plovers can often be found sitting around. They make a difficult subject for the cameraman. They're just too fearless. They just don't bother to move, even when you get within a few metres. And they don't seem to spend much time moving around looking for food. The fronds of the toothed rack are often covered in a thin gelatinous sheet, quite difficult to spot. These are colonies of a bryozoan called Flustralidia hispula. Each of these quite large colonies is produced by asexual budding from a sexually produced larva. Out of water there's not much to see, but underwater the colonies are transformed. Now each of the zooids comprising the colony produces a bell-shaped lophophore of ciliated tentacles. These are used to filter floating particles of food from out of the water. Each of the lophophores you can see here is smaller than a pinhead. The lophophores can be expanded and retracted at will. Once the tide drops low enough to start exposing the kelp, the herring gulls get busy searching for food amongst its long fronds. And then, on a really low tide, even the kelp is left high and dry. It's now that I can start searching the fronds for the striking little blue rayed limpet. These spend their lives grazing on the kelp and are rarely found on any other seaweeds. As you can see, each one lives inside its own little hollow that is created on the kelp. So let's finish September on a bright note. Red rags, another seaweed of the lower shore.